Next up, we have uh, Andre Rakic from uh, Chainlink. He's a developer advocate. And uh, Andre is going to talk about the Oracle problem and how Chainlink solves it. Um, and then he's going to talk a little bit more about what hybrid smart contracts are and how you can create them. Uh, Andre, thank you so much for being here. And I want to uh, say a, a quick thank you to you and your team. I mean, you put on an amazing uh, SmartCon event uh, just a month and a half ago uh, in New York. It was, it was truly amazing. Thanks. Thanks, Kevin, for introducing me. And also, like, thank you for the, all the kind words about SmartCon. Was was indeed really fun, and yeah, the recordings of the majority of the talks in our, is on our YouTube channel. So for 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 everyone who, who missed the event, I think there is like a quality uh, quality content over there. So uh, make sure to take a look. Okay, so today we are going to talk about decentralized Oracle networks and hybrid smart contracts. My camera is over there, perfect. And uh, I'll just quickly uh, change my slide. Okay, so my name is, as Kevin said, Andre Rakic. I'm one of the developer advocates for Chain Protocol Chain Collabs. Uh, you can see my Twitter handle listed over here and my email. Uh, if you want to uh, maybe follow along or, or chat about anything Oracle or Chain related afterwards, we'll have a time for Q&A. But if you, if you still need to reach out, feel free to use my Twitter account, it's Andre underscore dev. I'm more active there than on my email. And also if you're on Lens, my Lens handle is Andre.Lens. Okay, so uh, quick housekeeping rules and agenda. So today we are gonna talk about the Oracle problem. We're gonna uh, talk a bit about the, the importance of decentralized Oracle networks. And finally, I'll try to explain to you what Chainlink protocol is. And if you miss Marcon, we're gonna briefly cover the new project that the products that are announced at SmartCon and that are coming uh, pretty soon. Okay, so first, first of all, the Oracle problem. So to understand the Oracle problem, we first need to understand uh, what is smart contract. So I'm sure most of you are like uh, not even uh, know what smart contract is, but you know wrote a couple of them. But if you think about it, uh, there is one gigantic problem that smart contract solved. And that is the problem of trust. So if I go to the next slide here, you can see that, uh, and you, you can feel that, that traditional agreements, and by traditional agreements, I mean like agreements are all around us. Like if you want to purchase a Netflix subscription, if you want to like buy a new car or sell a condo or whatever, you need to sign some kind of an agreement. And with traditional agreements, the problem is that so-called contract operator or third party operator. Uh, which can have some common uh, interest. And that's a problem because you need to specifically trust that person of that or that entity. And you all remember that there was like a problem in the past with some uh, some centralized protocol that banned users, banned users to trade game stocks uh, when they needed the most. So that's the problem with, with, with traditional agreements. Now we have thanks to the blockchain technology and the cryptography, we have smart contracts uh, that are like uh, independent, independently stored on a blockchain. You know, smart contract is like a couple hundred of lines, uh, this script, so nothing fancy. But the thing is that uh, with smart contracts, we actually solve the problem of trust. So now you don't need to trust to anyone. You just need to uh, verify the correctness of any data in smart contract or computation, whatever, uh, just by using uh, blockchain and cryptography as underlying technologies, uh, which is really awesome, right? But smart contracts are not perfect, right? So smart contracts ca uh, can have their own problems. And one of the biggest problem is so-called smart contract connectivity problem. So what, that, that, what does that mean? Basically, uh, Smart contract uh, is limit, uh, has like a limited scope of data that can access. So for example, like it can be like a block number, transaction hashes, uh, maybe block timestamps, some other fancy opcodes, but that's pretty much it. So smart contract like can't know what's the current weather in, let's say New York or Boston or Berlin. Smart contract can't know like who won the latest World Cup in football. Uh, smart contract can't know what's the current price of any given asset, even those assets are on a blockchain, right? Uh, so that is like connect, smart contract connectivity problem. And that problem uh, was solved by oracles. But the problem with, with oracles uh, is 
is really simple. So, so basically, by definition, Oracle is any given entity, so it can be software or hardware or combination, whatever, that can provide off-chain data or off-chain computation to a smart contract. Like, that's it. So that's the Oracle problem. So now, naturally, what you can think is, yeah, if I have, like, decentralized infrastructure, uh, like, everything is, like, like decentralized uh, nodes on Moonbeam, whatever, and then I want to query, like, to, to get the latest price or whatever given asset. If my Oracle is centralized, then what's the point, right? So this is the Oracle problem. If you have that uh, Oracle entity, it can be software, hardware, whatever, and if it's like one single AWS server or something like that, then what's the point of Web3, right? So the solution to the smart contract connectivity problem is actually the chain protocol. So Chainlink Protocol is decentralized Oracle network. So it consists of multiple independent nodes and node operators. And uh, it's, it's like a blockchain, but Chainlink is not a blockchain. So Chainlink consists of like uh, nodes, like a, a network of decentralized nodes and needs to reach a consensus, but it's not a blockchain. So, so Chainlink is basically a middleware layer for smart contracts to communicate with the outside world. So, so if you need, for example, the title of the latest uh, movie or in cinema or whatever, and you need it for some reason in your smart contract, then you'll ping Chainlink to, to, to serve you as a middleware layer to, to, to provide you that kind of info. Okay, so as I mentioned uh, briefly about the Oracle problem, centralized oracles are basically point of failure. So if you have like a centralized node or centralized whatever piece of software, hardware, however we're gonna call it, entity, uh, you're at risk of getting inaccurate, inaccurate data or no data at all. Uh, so that's why Chainlink is highly focused on decentralization. So we have like a, so not, not we, but like Chainlink protocol is basically consist, as I said, of full replicas uh, of independent and civil resistant node operators. And you, we just need to, re, uh, so we just need to reach a consensus, provide that off-chain data to a calling smart contract, and that's it. Okay, so how reaching consensus works? It's pretty simple, actually. But imagine that you have now, that you want to build, let's say, lending and borrowing, prof lending and borrowing DeFi DEP, whatever, on Moonbeam, and you need naturally uh, some prices of some 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 assets. Like you, you can maybe support like the majority of top ten tokens or stuff like that. Never mind. But basically, uh, for uh, you will need like a price of some asset, for example. And uh, let's say that we want to query a price of token X, something like that, all Glimmer or whatever. So basically your calling smart contract, which is already deployed to a, to a blockchain, uh, will ping, and that's just like a simple one single line of code you will see in our docs. It's basically gonna ping Dawn, Dawn is short for decentralized Oracle network, to get uh, to get the price of that token X, so all of these nodes and node operators can have one or multiple source sources of of data for that particular token. So you know, uh, one node operator can have like some some DEX as a source of prices price for for that token. Other node operator can have like three sources, like can have that tax, can have like a CoinGecko API, for example, and can have like a, some C5 protocol as a source, doesn't matter. But the thing is that all of these nodes need to provide their version of the current price of that token at that moment. And then the network, the nodes are, are gonna communicate between the, themselves in like a P2P manner. And then the network will need to reach a consensus and provide as a transaction the, the callback value of the price. 
Y transaction because if you want to sync your nodes, like uh, like blockchain nodes, so imagine that you want to run a new blockchain node or whatever blockchain, uh, then you, you're going to need like that historical uh, data. You cannot actually query Chainlink again for prices. That's why we have like a proof as a transaction on a blockchain just to uh, just to to handle that edge case with with sync of the of the new blocks in a blockchain. But that's the idea. That's the general idea. Uh, okay, let, I think we can move forward, and I can talk a bit more about this as well. Okay. So and finally, like uh, we we were talking about like the, the smart contracts. We were talking about the oracles. Then the problem with smart contracts. Then the problem with oracles. Then briefly about chainlink. And finally, we came to hybrid smart contracts. So what is hybrid smart contract? In one sentence, you can describe it as like a smart contract get, that combines both on-chain data and computation and off-chain data and computation. That's it. So like one simple sentence, uh, combine on-chain and off-chain data and computation, and they're like, like extremely, extremely powerful. So there's like a variety set of chain products that can help you with that off-chain uh, stuff and I'll try to explain them now so you can like feel how you can create those hybrid smart contracts. Okay, so first of all, data vids. So data vids is basically uh, a way to get latest prices of any given asset and uh, not necessarily only a token. So uh, data vids were like one of the first products of Chainlink uh, when DeFi summer st started. Uh, naturally, all of those DeFi protocols needed a way to get the price of some tokens, right? Uh, so this is like a chart, chart for, for getting a price data. And it's like a, a bit more expanded picture of the previous, uh, of the previous uh, picture on the previous slide with, with a rich consensus, but that's pretty much it. So on the top right side, you'll have like a smart contract on some general purpose blockchain. And then on top left, you have the, the premium aggregators and access and access with the lever, which serve as a source. And in the middleware layer, you'll have like a network of dons that needs to communicate with the calling smart contract. The thing is that uh, after SmartCon, you, if, you, if you follow SmartCon, uh, the new data feeds were announced. So earlier, we only had like ability to get price, price data, so-called price feeds. But now you can also get NFT floor price fits, like you can query Chainlink to see uh, what's the current floor price of, for example, a BIYC NFT collection. So, so the trick with NFTs is that like, they can be unique and then can be, they can be traded on secondary markets on what's or not, but the, the floor price essentially exists. And a lot of hacker uh, hackathon teams asked about this feature. And also there's a proof of reserve feeds. So proof of reserve is basically if you want to see uh, how many wrapped BTC are there and what's the collateral of, let's say gold or stuff like that. So it can be uh, really powerful if you want to create DeFi dApps as well. Uh, so yeah, so how you can use it. So basically you need to go to data.chain.link, uh, select the blockchain, select the price feed pair, and then like you can see all of the necessary data and you can include it uh, in your smart contract. So what you can see there is you can see the uptime, how many oracles are serving that data, what's the latest price and so on and so forth. All of those data are basically queried from the blockchain, queried from the blockchain because essentially to get the price feed, uh, the, you just need to call the view function. So, View function, as you as you know, on blockchain, uh, still doesn't cost uh, any uh, any amount of net, uh, native coin on that blockchain. So, chaining data feeds to sum up uh, consists of price feeds, uh, NFT floor price feeds, and proof of reserve price feeds. Uh, it's like have like a fully covered of premium sources, and. Uh, yeah, I didn't mention that, but most of it are now upgraded to use OCR. OCR is important uh, because it saved uh, gas cost, reduced actually gas cost by 90%. How? Because previously, in the previous model, 
all of those node operators needed to create the transaction and then the the final price were also like being submitted as a transaction now with off-chain reporting they're communicated in like p2p network so only the consensus need to be reached via that famously powerful chaining algorithm uh okay vrf so the thing is that uh, if you want to get a random value on a blockchain, uh, you're basically at risk to so-called MEV attacks. And to be more specific, bad MEV attacks, because there's like a, examples of good MEV. So what's the problem there? So uh, basically, uh, there are, are actually two problems with randomness. So the first one, uh, you may be are not familiar with that or you're uh, but basically uh, the majority of programming languages provide pseudo randomness so when in javascript for example when you type like math.random it's actually a pseudo random number that can be predicted uh, on a very large scale but it's possible and that's not usually bad because if you have like an excel sheet with a couple hundreds of rows and you need like a unique ID identifier, you're perfectly fine to use like pseudo randomness. But on a blockchain where we're dealing with pe people's real money, that's maybe not a good idea. The second one, and uh, this is like a more, more dangerous one, is so-called uh, MEV attacks vulnerability with uh, on-chain randomness. So on-chain randomness like can be like, Combined, like you can use block dot difficulty of or block dot timestamp or whatever you can combine it and hash it or whatever. But the problem is that uh, miners or validators, depending on the chain, can manipulate that data, uh, and uh, this is like a really famous attack. I think it's SVC one two one or something like that. That's the official number in a security vulnerability database. So, so to avoid to be, to be wrecked, you just need to use Chainlink VRF and uh, some notable, yeah, this is the basically a slide where you can see how miner or validator can tamper-proof your, uh, your random value. Uh, I think I covered that. So yeah, the notable projects that are using VRF are like Avagotchi, uh, basically, you can use VRF to have like a secure lottery winners or some random trades or like to have like an NFT with, yeah, as I mentioned, random trades and so on and so forth. But the thing is that it cannot be manip manipulated and it's uh, also cryptographically verified that the name number is indeed uh, random. So not, not pseudo random, but random. How? Basically, if you receive a random value, that means that 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 value is indeed random because there is like a middleware smart contract called vrf.sol that have like uh, that have all of that elliptic curve cryptography in it to to verify the the numbers provided from chaining decentralized oracle network okay what next chaining automation so uh, smart contracts as you know are passive by nature what that does mean basically if you have like state a and you want to go to state b you need to explicitly ping your smart contract to execute some transaction or you'll you'll send the native coins but that's essentially it is again a transaction that will switch you from state a to state b to state c whatever but you know uh, without the transactions that's not possible so now imagine that you have, like, again, DeFi is really, really good example, but you have like some yield farming protocol or you want to make a better yield farming protocol on Hackathon. So usually you know, those yield farming protocols have that harvest function or whatever the name is. Uh, but uh, essentially uh, you can call it manually from some multi-sig wallet or some admin wallet or whatever, or you can automate that to put your, your smart hybrid smart contract on an autopilot, let's say. So first of all, to manually click 
on your MetaMask or whatever wallet you're going to use. That's kind of annoying. Second, you cannot be up awake 24-7, of course. And third, like we are all uh, developers, we want to to automate all of our flows uh, as much as possible. And you know, finally, if, you, if you're, your DeFi yield farming, whatever app gets a lot of traction, you can actually not, uh, can, you cannot be that fast to, to execute all of these transactions. But that's the only one example. Second one can be like a, a automation of, uh, let's say, if you have a, like a backup wallet and stuff like that. So social recovery of funds or something like that, you can use automation for that. Basically, you can, uh, there's a, without chaining automation, there's a way to, to have like a fully decentralized uh, DevOps in like pure Web3 manner. So how does that work? It's pretty simple. I think I have, yeah, yeah, it's pretty simple. So uh, you can have two types of automations. So the first one is time-based automation. So you're gonna create your smart contract, whatever the smart contract is. You're gonna go to keepers to change the flink or automation to change the flink. So uh, keepers is the is the older name. So don't confuse about the names. Uh, this product was rebranded as Smartcon. So uh, automation to change the flink. You'll connect your wallet. Uh, you will paste your. You will create like a new automation. You will paste your contract address, and uh, you'll you'll choose time based automation. So uh, then you just need to specify like a cron job. The UI is pretty friendly. It's going to help you with that. So you can automate your smart contract to execute on every 15 minutes or whatever. You're basically going to tell uh, the automation to execute that particular function on every 15 minutes and you're done. Uh, second and more powerful way is to use custom automation. So custom automation is basically pretty simple again. What you need to do is you need, you'll need to implement uh, automation compatible interface in your smart contract and Solidity. And that interface consists of only two functions. So first one is going to be check upkeep function. And in the 99% it's going to be like a view function. And the second one is perform upkeep function. So how that works. Uh, inside your check upkeep function, you're gonna have some logic that's gonna return true or false, like a Boolean value. So on each block on, or on each fixed time frame, whatever, on each 15 seconds or five seconds or on each minute, depends like on the chain you are, chaining down is gonna ping your smart contract by calling check upkeep function. So this is basically a question to your smart contract. Uh, do you need something for me? Do I need to automate something for you? From, for you okay? So it's going to call check upkeep. Your smart contract depends on the logic you implemented, going to return true or false, and maybe some additional data that is needed for perform upkeep function. But if check upkeep returns false, nothing happens. Uh, and because it's like a view function, you don't lose any money. And if check upkeep returns true, then automatically, uh, chaining down is going to call perform upkeep function. So inside the perform upkeep function, you'll have the actual logic for your automation can be, for example, calling a harvest function on that particular vault with that strategy. Like I'm just giving an example. And finally, I want to uh, talk a bit more about new stuff that are, that are coming. So we, we covered the benefits of smart contracts. We'll, cover three of uh, the most popular training products, which are like data fits, VRF, and automation. Uh, you're probably familiar with any API. This is like an old project, product, but basically any API is a way to construct HTTP GET requests from your smart contract to any given API in the outside world. And that's how you can get, let's say, a weather in that particular city, for example, uh, also extremely popular in hackathons, uh, and now the new stuff. So a couple of uh, new stuff are announced as coming soon on SmartCon. The first and the most popular one is CCIP. So this is a way 
uh, this is a cross messaging uh, protocol uh, to communicate between smart contracts on a different chains, different blockchains, and hopefully it's gonna end this trend of, uh, let's say, blockchain bridge hacks. Uh, then FSS or fair sequencing service. Uh, the idea is to finally prevent bad MEV. So with FSS, uh, the miners or validators or whatever, uh, basically the dawn will be miner or validator, but are not gonna be able to see uh, the, tra uh, the transactions given from a mempool uh, until the execution. So uh, it's gonna prevent reordering of transactions and pre hopefully prevent bad MEV. So I'm really excited about that. Then DECO. DECO is the way to get some off-chain data like your uh, credit score in traditional bank or something like that for loans and stuff like that, but using ZK, by, but using zero knowledge uh, technology to protect your privacy. And also uh, like the most famous is probably uh, crypto economics 2.0. So in December, if you were early adopter, uh, you will be able to try to stake some link uh, but, you know, afterwards, everyone will have that opportunity. So uh, the community on Twitter is pretty excited, excited about staking. Okay, so where you can go from here, uh, you can continue to chat with us on our Discord server. Currently, our uh, fall hackathon is in progress, which you can see by my background. So uh, you can see that Discord is now pretty busy. Uh, teams and participants are communicating with each other. We are trying to help them, to support them, we can answer questions, all that stuff. So you can join our Discord. Then, obviously, starter kits. So if you go to our uh, GitHub organization named Smart Contract Kit, you'll find all of the starter kits and boilerplate, boilerplate projects uh, for developing like smart contracts. So for Solidity, there is like uh, Hardhead hard starter kit, Foundry starter kit, Truffle circuit, Brownie circuit, April storage kit. So it's totally up to you which language you're gonna, which which framework are you gonna use. But also like there's like a, a circuits for Huff, uh, Viper, and uh, hopefully soon Yule. So you know you can actually see in action how you can write those hybrid smart contracts and also how you can test properly write unit tests and integration tests and all of that stuff. Uh, for, for a particular chain product. Uh, first of all, you're probably uh, going to stop by, by our documentation when you want to try to use Chainlink. So this is basically docs.chain.link. This is our official documentation. And you can see uh, listed products there. And also like for each product, you can see like a logo of various different chains. So this is like, you can see like uh, Moonbeam and Moon River over there. So if I go to for example, data feeds and click here. This is the introduction of data feeds. You can see price feeds, proof reserve feeds, uh, MFV4 pricing feeds. This one I even remember. This is like how to sequencers uptime feeds, basically a way to check if the sequencer is down. So, you know, Arbitrum Optimism, all of these chains doesn't have uh, decentralized uh, sequencers yet. So if I go here to contract addresses, uh, so if I, for example, choose Moonbeam or Moonriver or whatever, uh, it's gonna, uh, you know, for Moonbeam mainnet, I can see uh, which assets are currently available. So you essentially cannot query like a price of any token because there's a lot of scams. So we're trying to not support uh, tokens with low liquidity, but this, uh, uh, like a mature one, like Glimmer in terms of USD or Link in terms of USD or USDC in terms of USD, which should be like one or uh, around one all the time. But you can you can gap all of that, uh, all of those all of those uh, info, and also you can track the status of this particular network and this URL. So it's pretty handy if I choose to Moon River. Then again, Moon River mainnet. Uh, etc, etc, etc. 
So that will be it basically. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, I think we have some time. Uh, I didn't mention like Chainlink Academy, forgot about that, sorry. Uh, Kevin, just one sec. So if you go to chainlink.education, you, uh, you can see some beginner friendly uh, content for like entering the blockchain space and also like more advanced concepts like coding, advanced hybrid smart contract and solidity, uh, running maybe chainlink nodes and so on and so forth. So if you're a beginner in the space, I highly encourage you to visit our Chainlink Academy. So now it's time for time for questions. Thank you very much for having me, guys. Amazing, Andre. Thank you so much. And a, a very extensive uh, and expansive uh, set of knowledge, you know, was was dropped here. So we we absolutely appreciate it.